Good evening, I'm Graham Kennedy. John Mangos and I bring you the news coast to coast. John, is there any news fit to see on this Monday evening, the 6th day of November 1989? Graham, tonight Prime Minister Hawke tries to reassert control over the Labour Party in the lead up to the next election. A shark hunt underway on the Gold Coast after an attack on a 10-year-old boy in a residential canal. And Big Money sees a stylish century firm as the new favourite for the Melbourne Cup. In the Nine Network newsroom now is George Denikian. Graham, John, after a terrible time in federal parliament last week, Prime Minister Hawke is attempting to regain control of his undisciplined cabinet. The opposition scored heavily after the ministerial split over Labor's environmental policy. Today, Mr Hawke told his ministers to keep future squabbling behind closed doors, at the same time claiming there's no fundamental problem These in cabinet. These are the, uh, the uh, differences of emphasis that have been made by people within a party which is fundamentally united about our philosophy and our direction for this country. And trying to take the heat off his front bench, Mr Hawke hinted things weren't uh, well across the aisle. That is Peacock and Howard making it publicly clear that they simply do not trust one another. Uh, the divisions and the hatreds on the other side of politics are oh, profound. Yeah. A hunt is on in the Gold Coast for a shark which mauled a 10-year-old boy in an inland waterway system. Chris Fredrickson was attacked while swimming in the man-made mermaid waters canals. Experts believe the shark was lost as the suburb is 8 kilometres from the sea. It um, took a chunk out of my leg and I kicked it and it went away and I, I swam to the shore as fast as I could. State government has hired professional hunters to find the shark, which could still be in the canals. While microsurgery has saved Chris's leg, the government says the attack should be a warning to all Queenslanders. The majority of shark attacks occur in the late afternoon, especially around the mouths of rivers. Sydney police are seeking international help in their hunt for a suspected serial killer on the city's north shore. Four elderly women have been bashed to death in recent months, including two in the past week. Thirty-five detectives are working on the case. A psychiatrist is being used. And police have also asked colleagues in the United States for advice on the motives and methods of serial killers. While patrols have been increased around retirement homes, police also say the elderly can do a great deal to help themselves. We don't want to discourage them from walking uh, in their villages or wherever they walk. They ought to walk in company with another person. Uh, if two or three ladies go for a walk together, at least there's some type of uh, protection there for one another. And finally, there are nine big celebrations underway in New South Wales tonight after a record lotto draw with more than $12 million. Marking the 10th anniversary of the game, $8 million was put up for grabs in the first division. There were nine successful entries, each winning $888,889. Congratulations. That's all from the newsroom for now. I'll be back with more a little later in the show. Did you know that history is being made in this year's Melbourne Cup? Yes, it's the very first time, the very first time that I've actually got a horse in a sweep. I usually end up with a piece of blank paper. So yes, history has been made in no, the no, Melbourne no, no, Cup. No, 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 I mean it's the, the, no, I mean it's the first time that yes. there will be a lady jockey riding in the Cup. <laughs> There wouldn't be a... Really? Yes. A female... Yes. Lady jockey, that's right. A jockette. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're having a lend of me. No, I'm not. Listen, what's your tip for the big event? Well, it's, uh, John, I don't... I don't follow horses. I don't own any. I, don't, I really don't know anything about horse racing. If, if you press me, I'll say Farlap. I mean, he's got a good record. From what Far, I've read, Far, great Far, big Far, horse. Farlap is dead. But I just saw him on Channel 7. <laughs> well, you see, that just goes to show how much I know about horse racing. Farlap's dead. Dead. I didn't even know he was sick. <laughs> Cup fever running high, Melburnians turned out in force for this morning's grand parade, determined to get their money's worth. The ranks of old-time cup winners are thinning, but the survivors include Piping Lane 
Hyperno and what a nuisance. These men, between them, won a swag of Melbourne Cups. Master trainer George Hanlon and former top jockey Roy Higgins, who never rode quite this tall in the saddle. Nor did he master singing on horseback. The rhinestone cowboy was the star attraction at one of many Swish Cup Eve parties. Earlier today, the golden girl Empire Rose exercised at Flemington. The big mare looked fitter and harder after her McKinnon stakes run and is ready to emulate last year's success, although trainer Laurie Laxon isn't giving anything away. Well, it's not going to be easy, but uh, it's possible. The new cup favourite is Stiley Century, attempting to become the first three-year-old in 48 years to win the cup. Connections had to pay a $37,000 late entry fee just to get the cult into the field. Here's the market. Stylish Century favourite at five to one ahead of Empire Rose at sixes, Kosh King at eights, Sedestin at nine to one, Go Pack at tens, Cold Diesel at eleven to one, and the rank outsider is Salas Opera at two hundred and fifty to one. Provided the rain holds off, my trifecta for the big one is Empire Rose from Kosh King and Sea Legend. John Tap, Graham Kennedy, Coast to Coast. John Tap. We had a call from a um, clairvoyant who said, now I'll never think of the name, Torrific, would, she saw it win. So for the first time ever, I'm having some money, not a lot, although I could splurge actually, uh, on tor <laughs> Torrific, then I have... <clears throat> Then I, I have some money on Torrific for a win and a place right. each way. I each think way, called. yes. And then I'm in a sweep, which is so difficult I can't explain. It's the same sweep you'd be in where yeah, the there are eight horses or something. That's right. No, eight dollars. You have to pay eight dollars to go in it. We're, eight, we're yes. boxing. The, the coast to coast. No, this is, is a horse race, definitely. Doing a, a box. Yes, a box trifecta. It's called. That's oh, what we're doing. It. Sorry. Mm. Well, and we're seven horses in a. Out of well, now I have another trifecta. <laughs> oh, Angus will call them out. It's called Empire Rose, I think, is one of them. Hang on, I'll, uh, Kosh King is another, which is one word I've just discovered. And what's the last one? Stylish century. Stylish. Stylish century, is it? Yes. So that's my trifecta, and I've got uh, 20 cents on that one. Hey. <laughs> I'm a big plunger. Next time your sink gets blocked, give me a call. British contenders for the first Anglo-Soviet space flight have now been eliminated down to the final four. Of the three men and one, wo one woman, only one Brit... What? What is all this short talk? One wo, one Brit. What? <laughs> one wo, one Brit. Eh, 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 eh. <laughs> That's more. That's a Brit. One Brit will travel with the Soviets. Yes, will Randall play him back saying one whoop? No, he can't do that. Can't. What did I say that was. I well, I'll do it. Three men on. and one woman. British contenders for the first Anglo Soviet space flight have now been eliminated down to the final four. One of the three men and one whoop. That's what you, <laughs> that's what you said. And well, then you didn't finish Britain. You said one whoop and one Brit. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. It's a, well, they. For some reason, they cut to me, and I was um, simply reading it with you, thinking, isn't he doing it badly? And, uh, I don't know. I didn't mean to get into this at all. I'm sorry. Start from the beginning. Joe, would you roll back for uh, uh, treasure phase here? <laughs> British contenders for the first Anglo-Soviet space flight have now been eliminated down to the final four. <laughs> of the three men and one woman, only one... British person will travel with the Soviets on a space mission set for 1991. Oh, I think one just went then. Oh. What I'm about to say is not necessarily the view of Bond Media or the management of any Channel 9 station. This is me about to make the following introduction to a story. I sincerely hope that the people who were responsible for forcing the Grand Prix to go ahead in Adelaide yesterday face charges of criminal negligence. First time, no, Somewhat first better time, weather graced no, Adelaide today no, as the city started returning itself to normal. 
It was in stark contrast to yesterday when the street circuit was dumped with 30% of the month's average rainfall in four hours. We were witnessing rather unpleasant carnage. Obviously, Petrezzi was also unwilling I mean, to criticise the officials' decision. On, it's our obligation to raise. Unless it was snow, or unless the circuit was literally underwater, the motor racing goes ahead. But there were questions about the track's ability to drain off heavy rain. We'll have a look at where the, uh, the two or three problem areas were in terms of drainage and see whether in fact there's a way of diverting water. While ticket sales may have been down due to the rain, afterwards it was like an Indian marketplace as fans haggled for souvenirs. It seems just about every year in the race's five-year history, Adelaide has provided a controversial end to the season. This time, whether or not the race should have been run at all will be debated by drivers and teams until they roar into action again in four months' time. Don't you think that's disgusting? I absolutely do agree with you 100%. It, it should never have gone ahead. Making people drive at that speed, I mean, it's a car race, so obviously going to be fast, in weather conditions that you'd be arrested for uh, on the road. That's right. I think absolutely disgusting. Somebody somewhere forgot that there were people's lives at stake Human here. beings, yes. Alain Prost, who's the world champion, his protest was to do one lap and then bail out. Yes. And he showed a lot of common sense, I think, Certainly. in doing that. I do hope, uh, whoever it is, the people who decided that that should go ahead, I hope they get into the most terrible trouble. I'm with you. Hear, hear. Although she's not the favourite anymore, giant Kiwi mare Empire Rose has certainly attracted huge public support in her quest to win her second consecutive Melbourne Cup. I've got that in a trifecta. <laughs> the seven-year-old will have to rewrite the record books to achieve victory. But if confident connections count for anything, Rosie is just about across the line. Magnum. <laughs>
Tim puts it down to an acute psychological disorder. She's sort of a Jekyll and Hyde personality. When we're spelling her at home in the back paddock, my wife will go and hang out the washing and Rosie will come over and check out to make sure she's doing it properly. And yet when she's racing, she's very, very aggressive and Tony says that uh, she's got that will to win that, that makes good horses. She's asleep. Another one of those little personality quirks we told you about. I'm sure she'll wake up shortly. <laughs> Do you think she loves to run? Oh, yes, right, and she loves the crowd, too. She likes those cameras. <laughs> She's um, nice and relaxed, and, and she knows the crowd's looking at her and happy about her. To come from where she did and come uh, fifth or just missed out on fourth was a great run for her. Is she ready for the cup? Yeah, I feel so, yes. Are you ready for the cup? Yes, definitely. Has she got a big bum? Um, from behind she is. <laughs> Still to come, some unusual fun and games in the south of England. All ahead on Graham Kennedy, Coast to Coast. Starring John Mangos, the most health-conscious man on Australian television. If he isn't in bed by 12 o'clock, he goes home for a good night's sleep. <laughs> Cute, wholesome actress Sally Field was born in Pasadena, California on this day in 1946. Rocker Glenn Fry was born on this day. Fry was one of the founding members of the Eagles, one of the greatest West Coast bands of the 70s. His recent solo career has been highlighted by the hit The Heat Is On from the film Beverly Hills Cop and by a tour to Expo in Brisbane with the Little River Band. Former Easy Beat, George Young, was born in Glasgow on this day in 1948. If you don't know what the Easy Beats are, that's what they give to older policemen. George met Harry Vander in a hostel in Sydney's West and began one of Australia's most successful songwriting partnerships. Besides many hits for the Easy Beats, they've also written for John Paul Young, who by now must be known as John Paul Old. George is the brother of Angus Young from ACDC, who wears schoolboy clothes on stage. Off stage, he wears school girls' clothes. Hence the name of the band, ACDC. Dwile flonking. I have a story on dwile flonking, J John. <laughs> Can't have say you heard it. of dwile flonking? I can't say that I have grown, no. I hope I'm pronouncing it properly. Dwell. Do you think it might be dwell? It's spelt D W Y A L L and then regular, you know, flonking. <laughs> no, truly. Dwell flonking involves putting a dishcloth, apparently, on the end of a stick, and then the members of the opposite sex hold hands in a circle around the flonker. <laughs> I bet you knew that all the time, did you? In Australia, we call this a dishcloth, but here in East Anglia, it's called a dwile. It's part of a bizarre fertility ritual called dwile flunking. Basically, you, you sort of get your dwile on the end of your stick and you swiddle around and you get one of them with it, don't you? In order to get the fertility juices flowing, you've first got to do some fancy footwork. And if you fail, there's a terrible price to pay. And you've got to drink the contents of this here chamber pot. His chamber pot is it? I'm it don't matter you, dear. For the moment, it's yours. I'm afraid, my dear, you ain't made it. Oh, oh, no! You know what that means? <laughs> In this fertility ritual, courting couples get to strut their stuff and display their plumage. So do people get aroused? I mean, do you fall in love? Well, we can fall in love. I mean, in fact, uh, I met my girlfriend that way, who's soon to be my wife. Oh, no! The squire is dead! The only thing that will revive him is the kiss from a fair young maiden. We need a volunteer. <laughs> 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 
upside down, mopping up the whiskey on the floor. It's obvious by the end of the day that fertility East Anglia style has nothing to do with age and everything to do with imagination. Because this gram got her man, and me, I got the boot. Ow. Updating the news, and nearly 100 people are homeless after a freak storm in northern New South Wales. High winds, rain and hail battered the tiny town of Ellsmore. Every house was unroofed. Two were completely destroyed. Residents are tonight sleeping in a nearby hall. Allegations against famous medical researcher Dr William McBride are now being heard by the New South Wales Medical Tribunal. Dr McBride is alleged to have performed unnecessary caesarean operations and falsified experimental data. Dr McBride left the Foundation 41 Research Institute last year after being found guilty of scientific fraud, but just last month was reinstated to the board. And the Prime Minister has continued to push his hope of an Asian trading bloc at a dinner in Canberra tonight. Representatives from countries in our region are in the capital for the important Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Conference. Heavy rains caused an embarrassing deluge in the meeting hall today. Debate tomorrow is expected to be drier. And that's all from the newsroom. Now it's back to the studio. What? <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe... Do you... Uh, no, I was, I, I want, I'm sorry, it was my fault. I wanted to thank George Denikian for bringing us up to date. Right. My fault. I wanted to ask you if you believe the rumours that Charles and Diana's marriage could be in trouble. Oh, don't tell me that, Zon. I'm still getting over the shock of Joe Pearson and Rob Jell. Here's the story of an accident victim who came as close as, uh, as, close as you can get to death. He not only survived, but he's making a miraculous recovery. Just four months ago, 30-year-old Ray Holly was given no chance of a normal life. <coughs> Unconscious with a severe brain injury after a car accident, paramedics warned his wife Julie to expect the worst. I could hear Ray breathing in the background. They had what he called the death rattles in his throat, so I knew then that it could go either way. Still deep in a coma weeks later, doctors began searching for ways to stimulate him. Friends' voices and favourite songs had no effect. Then Julie remembered a scuba diving holiday on the north coast where the couple had listened to whales singing as they moved about the ocean floor. <coughs> Using the haunting sound of the giant beast's underwater chorus, the Sydney Aquarium made Julie a special cassette with remarkable results. As soon as they played the whale music, um, they, they, they could see the emotion. I was starting to cry. You know, it's just peaceful, just really peaceful. The noise of the music was being processed by his brain and being linked in with his memory and then bringing about that really marvellous response which must have just so delighted his wife when she saw it. Step by step with Julie's help, Ray began the painful process of learning to walk again. Although it may be several years before he's fully recovered, there's barely a trace of the injury which nearly claimed his life. Probably because I had so many chances of dying and so little of living. While doctors have described Ray's recovery as remarkable, other coma victims aren't so lucky, many being left with permanent disability. A lot depends on how severely they've been brain injured and in what part of, the, what part of their brain has been affected. Hardly able to contain his joy at being so well, Ray has only one wish, to go back under the sea and hear the whales again. Sandra Falloon, Graham Kennedy, Coast to Coast. We have a terribly nice audience in tonight, John. Have you noticed? I have noticed. Lovely people. They're really out there. We thought it might be fun to show them. You see, they love this. Look at that. Look. Because <laughs> they can go home and watch themselves. We're pre-recorded. We record coast to coast earlier in the evening in front of a live studio audience. I think they, there's a lot of Australians out there tonight. <laughs> no, uh, no... Uh, Patrioti. Patriotes. Patriotes. I've, why can't I get that right? Patriotes. Is plural. Patrioti is singular. Is that different to fili? Yes. Patrioti is a countryman. What's a fili? A friend. What's a pencil? Molivi. <laughs> Your turn. Anzac Day next year will be a special day of remembrance. It marks the 75th anniversary of the landing at Gallipoli. And for our surviving diggers, the federal government is sparing no expense. Ah, white crosses, they belong now to Australia 
forever. Douglas MacArthur was speaking during the Second World War, but his remarks could have applied to any campaign at any time where Australians have fought. It was 75 years ago, and it was the beginning of the great adventure. November 1914, and the boys of the first AIF were in a hurry to get over there. Most of them thought they'd be home in a year, maybe two at the most. The reality, of course, was very different. Hey! Three quarters of a century on, and a nation pays tribute, not only to those first Anzacs, the diggers of Gallipoli and the Somme, but to all the men and women of the Australian Army through all its campaigns. In Canberra's Anzac Parade, near the War Memorial, and alongside the monuments to the Navy and the Air Force, now stands this memorial to the Army. There can be no more fitting place for such a memorial than Anzac Parade. A word that has come to symbolise, in two short syllables, all those enduring qualities of service and courage and sacrifice and mateship that we associate with the Army and the Armed Forces. It was dedicated now to mark the beginning of a series of events commemorating and leading up to next April 25. On that 75th Anzac Day, the surviving original diggers will be reunited at Gallipoli. The federal government's flying them to Turkey to take part in a very special ceremony. The Prime Ministers of Australia, Great Britain, New Zealand and India will be there too at dawn on the 25th, with as many of the veterans from the original multinational landing force as can travel with them. This monument is to the soldiers of all the wars. The next memorial to be built in Anzac Parade, by the way, will be to the veterans of Vietnam. Peter Harvey, Canada. And now, the finance report. I get $18,750 a week. What do you get? Caught between the excitement of yesterday's Grand Prix and tomorrow's big horse race, the Australian share market was deathly quiet today and showed only a slight fall. The Japanese Nikkei Dow is also weakened, but London's FT100 is up. The Aussie dollar is selling at 78.02 US cents, and gold has gained three and a half dollars in New York. For a pop song to succeed these days, it's almost mandatory to have a catchy video to go with it. The band, mental as anything, has turned the video into an art form. Being invited onto the set of a Mental as Anything video is a rare privilege. Okay, cut. Let's try and favor people, you know, stay on people for a little bit. Of, yeah, on mm -hmm. The director of this extravaganza is Creve Stenders, who worked on the Mental's previous clip. If he's the sculptor, then the band is clay, and the setting, in this case, is the Australian outback. More of that block out. This outback son's murder. Now? Right, rolling. The song they're dramatising is Baby You're Wild, written by Pete the bass player. Actually, if the truth be known, it was his wife. The way the song was written was funny. My wife actually is, is a bit of a, she's a sort of a demon, a demon um, songwriter, you know, a bit of a closet artist, a, a, a cottage industry uh, songwriter. And she said, look, here, Pete, here's a song for you. She wrote these sort of, you know, these scrappy lyrics. And um, just sort of adopted the lyrics a little bit and, and whacked it all together. And uh, eventually it's actually got onto the album and she won't let me live it down, I'll tell you what. She's, she wants to make a whole album now, I think. Just adjusting my breasts. <laughs> the leading lady in this epic is actress Genevieve Lemon. Starring in the movie Sweetie, she was pipped at the post at this year's AFI Awards by Meryl Streep. Uh, how would you describe your role in this film? It's very sophisticated, Richard. I think you probably have to see the clip to get the whole story. It's very complex. But it's, it's subtle, and um, I think I've managed to find the motivation okay. It's really the music. 
But you are playing the love interest, is that a fair description? I think you could call it the love interest of the whole band. She's like a fantasy woman. People of this caliber don't come cheaply. The price tag on this production is around $30,000. It's a costly business to feed a whole crew of people at lunch, dinner and, uh, and breakfast the next morning. Understandably, tensions are pretty high with so much at stake, but if the band are nervous, they're not showing it. And when you do sit down to write a song, especially being artists and all that, do you kind of half think of the video? Well, sometimes we do, yeah. We, we'll write the video first and then the song is an afterthought. It's, it's a video that's important. Mendel is anything of set standards in dress as well as music. Good Aussie gear, eh? They were declared national treasures in the press recently. So what does the future hold? The road to hell may be paved with good intentions, but I think our intentions are pure and we're still existing happily. So that was Richard Wilkins reporting, wasn't it? Indeed it was. Most of May, Richard does uh, uh, MTV regularly on most of these stations, probably not in Perth, I feel. It's interesting hair. It looks like he has it done with a whippersnipper. <laughs> Can you name the first, a lot of people think, you know, video, uh, clips, video, uh, videos that you have to have for your song. Mm. A lot of people think that that's terribly new. Can you name the first song to use a video clip? No. What was it? God Save the Queen. Truly? It used to be in all the cinemas and it used to be played at the end of every night's transmission on television. Actually, when you think about it, Her Majesty, really, she was really the Kylie Minogue of her day. Who's sorry now? Bob Ansett is sorry now. He's in the same boat as Paul Keating. They both have budget problems. <laughs> We didn't know how to draw a Melbourne Cup sweep in the coast-to-coast -coast office today. None of us have had any experience with sweeps. So we asked the blokes at the Weather Bureau, because they use a sweep system for the weather. You know, clients in one hat, forecasts in the other. The cities in one, fork, and they go like Perth, they go 84, you see. <laughs> so if your city isn't mentioned in the following, it means you've been scratched. <laughs> Brisbane fine and 30 degrees, Sydney windy with showers and 21, Canberra a few showers, 19 degrees, Melbourne mostly fine for the cup and 19 degrees, Hobart a shower or two, 18, Adelaide cool but mainly fine with 19 degrees, Darwin a late storm and 34, Perth fine and hot with 33, Alice Springs fine and 27 degrees. Oh, oh did you see that? It's huge. Oh, another tremor. How I've missed you terribly. How's the little Filipino lace? Fine. Fine, he says. How did that come about? Well, he's conceded now. Well, he sent away for her. No, no, I, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't, but someone's... You see, television can become very boring and people resort to practical jokes. And I think someone sent... Bob Yates, our floor manager, one of those, how would you like to marry a Filipino lady? And, uh, and that's how that came about. But Bob has uh, not at all any connections with uh, the Asian races. That's right, isn't it, Bob? That's right. <laughs> no, he's got a white Australian with teeth and everything. It's terrific. <laughs> I've been handed this. What do I do with this? It's been so long since I've done this. We could ask uh, what it is, or whether it's a late item, and then... Uh, is this a late it's... item? Yes. Aha, have you just handed it to me? Yes. Has it been checked? Yes. What do we say now? How, How many, many sources? sources? Wow! Ah! <laughs> Name it! Horseradish! Horseradish, what, a, what, a, what an appropriate source on Melbourne Cup Eve. Absolutely. Horseradish, well done. A major breakthrough in medical science today when surgeons announced that the conventional bandages... Well, this is interesting, John. You can tell it's interesting. I'm doing it in a special voice. <laughs> breakthrough in medical science today when surgeons announced that conventional bandages are to be replaced with aluminium foil. 
Patients wrapped in the foil still have the same risk of dying, but if they do, the body remains fresher. Good night. <laughs>